This is the Blockade Pinball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Freebus, a.k.a. Shut Your Trap. Joining me, as always, halfway across the world, it's Jared Morgan. Hello, everybody. How are you going? All right. I don't know. Things are uh, things are decent around here. The, the, the weather's warming up. Went and saw Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and it was good. Um, oh, good. Yeah, yeah the, it's, it's on my list of things to watch. As uh, trilogies are hard, the third movies a lot of times just don't do it <laughs> yeah it's like you shouldn't have really bothered like you know just think of the matrix for example yeah, but right. don't knock the matrix i love the matrix um <laughs> <laughs> no i think th- i think the difficulty is is that you know the first movie uh catches everybody off guard the second movie uh makes good on and and improves everything that everybody liked about the first movie and then yes. the third movie they realize they have to wrap things up but they also have to top whatever was in the other two. And I think that's where the stumbling block uh, comes um, mm. because there's just not it. Things aren't being done for creative purposes. They're being done for business purposes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And you know, when, when directors have to, I guess, work within the constraints of money, <laughs> that's where things tend to go to tank. I think. Yeah. Um, but this one, I, I was very pleased in that. I mean, I, I'll put it to you this way. I still think Guardians 2 is my favorite of the three. Mm, but It was great. But I didn't feel like this uh, failed in any way. I think as a trilogy, and yes, okay, fine. Throw in the holiday special because you kind of need it. Um, very self-contained. Um, Good to know. Other than needing to know a little bit about what happened in, you know, Endgame. <laughs> um but other than and you know and and infinity war uh, that's really all you need it it it's not um beholden to all of the mcu uh and so i really like that right okay um because it gets more and more confusing as they release more movies like it really you does. know it's like trying to watch everything in like the you know the equivalent of the razor order of star wars yeah is <laughs> is ridiculously difficult now because there's so much material out there yeah you know it's a minefield yeah and you Um, know there there are some movies that really lean in heavily to you have to have watched this there almost should be a disclaimer at the on on this trailer saying before you watch this movie you should have watched this this and this you know in the mcu because that would actually help i think yeah the the funny thing is uh i don't think i'm doing spoilers here for Infinity War Endgame when I say that obviously uh, Gamora died (laughs) and then got brought back thanks to time travel but being a different Gamora uh, that doesn't hadn't existed with the Guardians that entire time so doesn't know their history uh, with the group Um, obviously that's the stuff that you need to have seen those two movies for Mm. but and I think about with people's gripes about Mandalorian season three of, oh, well, if you didn't watch Book of Boba Fett, you would have never known how Mando and Grogu got back together again. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, well, why wouldn't you have watched that? <laughs> mm. I, I don't understand why you would have purposely skipped it and missed that. Yeah. It's all part of the same story. Um, yeah. And so, it was literally uh, released in between the two Mandos. Yeah. To tie, well, yeah. Yeah, and so I find it interesting that the Guardians isn't getting any of that flack, um, hmm. when clearly you that would have need to have seen those two movies in order to understand what's going on with Gamora. But um, and you know that's that's a I would I would have forgotten about that because I've seen those two movies ages ago now, and I like it's almost like they need a previously in the MCU. But here's the thing: you it's know? such a. <laughs> Once you hear it, you'll go, oh, yeah, I remember that. But it's not oh, right. It's not okay. dependent on all the minutia and details of what went on in that moment. Yeah. You know, it's more a, right. It's more simply, she died, she came back, she wasn't the same. End of story. Now let's, let's continue story. with the story. Yeah, let's continue with the Right. You know. That's good. So, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, enough said, right? <laughs> enough said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I was I was really pleased with that. And then I'm very pleased because uh, my Lakers basketball team is now advanced to the conference finals. Uh, we'll see how far they go. But uh, I say that, and this is now all lost on Jared, who I'm sure 
does not follow the NBA. Um, mm, sports ball. You're yeah. right. Um, <laughs> but uh, for a team that started uh, two of eight and had a 0.3% chance of even making it into the playoffs, um, they're doing really good. So um, uh, we'll see how far this, uh, this run goes. But yeah, I don't know. That's good. I'm in good spirits. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, that's good. It's good that you're in good spirits. Um, streaming has been going well on the Twitch channel. Um, having some, uh, been try, I tried out the, the lunchtime streams local time here. Hmm. No one was on because it was, I don't know, ridiculous o'clock in the Northern Hemisphere <laughs> at lunchtime um, for a lot of folk. And um, uh, so I thought, okay, well, how do I solve that problem? Because I don't, I don't stream unless there's people who are around to yeah. interact with. Like, why, why bother other eyes? Right. Right. You could you know, easily just, just play the game by yourself and be done with it. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, if I mean, I'm, I know some people like to watch people play to look at strategy and stuff, but, mm. you know, I'm not one of the top players. So, you know, they, they'll probably have a, a mix, <laughs> a, a mixed experience if they watch me for pro tips. Um, but, you know, so I thought, well, how am I going to solve this problem? And I, I tried streaming my time about 10 p.m which works out to be, according to what Wilbur's and M11 say, uh, is around 12 o'clock um, UK time. And I think, uh, I don't know if M11's... 12 noon? Same zone. Yeah, 12 noon. Okay. Yeah, so 10, 10 p.m. is about 12 noon over there the previous day. So that works out really well. So I can, I've can i regularly had Wilbur's and M11 join and uh, say hello and a few other people have dropped in occasionally as well so it seems like a good time to do it which means that it's after the kids go to bed in my time um and i usually do 10 to 11 30 ish depending on how i'm feeling and then wrap it up after that i mean i'm staying up anyhow to that time generally so it yeah. doesn't really matter um so yeah that's uh that's what's going on and it's it's going well so i can definitely if you haven't checked out the streams yet, um, you can pretty much guarantee I'll be doing a stream on my Tuesday 10 p.m. and my Thursday 10 p.m. The, the schedule on the the Black A Pinball uh, Twitch page is updated um, to reflect that now. It's not lunchtime streams anymore. Um, so yeah, come and check it out. Come and say good day. Have a chat while we're playing. I, I like to talk when I'm playing pinball. It doesn't worry me. Some people are like weird. Like when I go to tournaments, you know, people go, oh, don't talk to me. I'm playing pinball. It's like, dude, like you really like you can't talk and play pinball at the same time. It's not that hard. Yeah. Like, you know, two different parts of the brain working here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Come and check it out. I'd love to have you along and I'd love to have a chat. Cool. I've been uh, not playing so much pinball at all because I got myself back into Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, mm. I played it a while ago on the PS4. Got to a certain point. I was—I think I've mentioned this before. I was playing it at the same time as God of War. That was a mistake because um, mm. I wound up abandoning both of the games. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but I've got it on PC now, and I finally caught up to where I was on the PS4. Um, it, it feels like I was a little bit deeper than I expected. Um, you know, mm. probably 20, 25, 28 hours in. Um, but having what a good is time. The... What is the reg- what is sort of like the average game time experience for that game? I have no idea. <laughs> right. I really okay. have no idea. I'm so I'm doing my favorite thing, which is let's try and be as stealthy as possible and take out as many enemies as possible without them knowing Being I'm there. <laughs> Being basically playing it like MGS. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so that means if I you know, send an arrow into a, a a machine and get its attention. I go into hiding mode and I don't fire another shot until it stops looking for me, and then I fire another shot. And so it's time consuming. Um, yeah, right. But I so enjoy you're just, doing. You're that. still I destroying like... the machine, yes. but you're doing it very slowly, very methodically. Yes, I'm not. Mm. I don't like going out in a hail of bullets. Um, right, so yeah. I. Uh, so it takes a little bit longer because I'm doing it that way. I'm not. I'm not really good at uh, setting traps and you know things for it to run over on the ground and everything. I'm just let me just fire some arrows off and uh, see what I can do. So okay. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at on that. Um, all right, folks. So what did you tune in today? Well, we 
have always had a bunch of questions that whenever we talk to Mel, he's never able to answer because it gets a little mm. too technical or a little too on the design end. And as Zen has grown, Mel has kind of gotten a little bit more and more stepped back from the, um, not the day-to-day operations, but the nitty-gritty of what is going on. Um, clearly, yeah. when you've all of a sudden hired a whole bunch more designers, uh, there's more people to <laughs> interact with and, and keep track of what their progress is um, as the company itself is growing. So uh, we were referred to, you know, you should probably talk to Deep. And, uh, you know, as he's head designer, he'll have the answers. So mm. that's exactly what we did. We, um, we wrote a whole we bunch did. of questions, emailed them over because... Uh, a, scheduling is hard, and B, Deep's not quite comfortable doing a live uh, interaction yet. Um, yeah. You know, language barrier and all. So we fired yeah. off these questions. Deep went ahead and sent back video responses. So this isn't us pretending like we're doing a live interview. Not at all. We're going to read no. the questions off. We're going to go to the video of what Deep answers, and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about um, what he says. Unfortunately, obviously, that means we're not going to be able to have any follow-up uh, to whatever he responds with. Yeah. But we do have some follow-up questions that we will try and get over to him so he can just answer in text and we'll update you what those answers are um, in a future show. Yeah. Um, just to qualify some of the, the points he made. So, yeah. It should be... Uh, there's some good answers in, in the video, so I think you should enjoy it. Yep. So we should dive in. Yep, let's dive in. Let's uh, let him... You can go and ask the first question, then we'll go from there. Yeah, all right. Well, we're going to let him uh, first do his little uh, introduction. Uh, just, yeah. You know, because it's interesting. Here we go. It is. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. The machines behind me are part of my collection, but this is the only pinball machine I have at the moment. I hope I can get some Williams Bowley pins in the future. Let's jump into the questions. All right. So our first question for Deep was, uh, who are some of your favorite pinball designers and what of their influences can we see on his designs? Let's see what Deep has to say. I don't really have a particular favorite designer. Uh, Every designer did good and not so good games. Uh, However, there are some pins that I like maybe a bit better, such as Theater of Magic, Scared Stiff, Jurassic Park, Adam's Family, Medieval Madness, Monster Bash, but I could go on until tomorrow because almost every single pin has something that's fun or different than on any other. But to answer the second part of the question, it's not easy to come up with entirely original toys and ideas with every design, but I always try to think further to change things, even if some mechanic influence me. The possibilities are much wider in digital pinball also. Uh, we have more tools to work with. Uh, for example, there is the giant snake uh, on the Son of Zeus table. That was somewhat influenced by the snake locker on the Metallica pinball. But I reimagined it a bit so it could be more interactive. So I find that kind of interesting that uh, he's taking mm. influence of toys that are on some of these machines, machines and then seeing how he can make them uh zenified <laughs> that's know, right yeah. yeah and you know we we have seen that before and commented several times that you know a lot of the designs with zen do play homage to other machines so this this just confirms the fact that yes they absolutely do look to other machines for inspiration but not necessarily directly lift in copy yeah like there's always there's always iteration on it to make it suitable for for um digital which you know i think it's really hard with pinball not to these days because there's so much essentially prior art out there it's hard to come up with original yeah. ideas right yep all right well the the next question that we uh, posed to deep was do you have a, a favorite pinball thing so you know things like ramps bash toys drop targets multi-ball wireframe habits you know or habit rails and all that sort of stuff so Let's see what uh, Deep had to say about that. Sure. 
Sure I do. Uh, I would mention Frankie from the Monster Bash, uh, the T-Rex from Data East Jurassic Park, uh, the Ringmaster on Circus Water, the Boxer and especially the Jump Rope Mechanics on Champion Pub. Uh, this list could also go uh, on and on <laughs> as well. Uh, I also like Curvy and uh, Loopy Rams, like uh, the ones on Data East, uh, Tales from the Crypt and Star Wars. Curvy ramps. Curvy ramps. So I guess yeah. it's it's no surprise that uh, he was responsible for uh, Adventureland. <laughs> There's a yeah, because that thing's <laughs> full of curvy stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and then the yeah. same thing I think about just with um, like Return of the Jedi, how there's the ball does a lot of interesting traveling on that table too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I like yeah, the idea it, of the the. See. That he's likes the bash toy, too. And you know we we've seen that uh, in some of the more recent designs as well coming through. We get a lot of influence on bash toys um, in in the, uh, the the new tables that we've seen in early access. Yeah. So you know even if some of those designs weren't his, I think the influence on the bash toy does seem to resonate through the designers as like a a bit of a, a theme yeah. as well so yeah there is definitely a, it feels like there's a bit of influence there yeah all right so the uh, next question uh <clears throat> was why doesn't zen follow the model of releasing code updates to tables as user feedback comes in much like stern jersey jack and spooky even 90s era williams had multiple rom updates so hmm. let's find out what he has to say about that. The main reason behind this is the online leaderboard. Uh, if we change something in the table that affects the scoring possibilities, we would have to reset the leaderboard and uh, this is what we want to avoid as much as possible. If we come out with a new title and we carry over legacy tables, we can alter the rules that affect scores or gameplay. So if you have suggestions for any of the tables that can make the rules better, please let us know. Uh, if there is an exploit on a specific table, uh, we try to fix it as soon as possible. And uh, we reset the leaderboard as we did already uh, a couple of times in the past. We also try to fix the bugs you guys are constantly reporting, which we are extremely grateful for. So thank you uh, and keep them coming. So it doesn't mm. sound like, uh, well, A, goddamn leaderboards. <laughs> well, this is the thing that I find is a bit of a disconnect here, right? Yeah. Like, sure, he, st he states the leaderboards as a, as a reason for not resetting things. But then we've had several leaderboard resets over the course of early access and going into Steam releasing consoles. Like, there are leaderboards reset all the time. Yeah. And I've seen this going into the game, then having to redo all my scores in the leaderboard. So I don't, I don't see them being very adverse to resetting leaderboards because they do it all the time now. Like, and I mean, we've, we've <laughs> gone down this many a time where it's, just, it's yeah. the wrong decision. Because, yep. uh, and especially in light of what all your pinball manufacturers are doing, you know, since your, their tables can be um, wirelessly connected. Now. connected. Um, yeah. I'm not asking for simple, you know, a tweak here, a tweak hit there, and then you have to do the leaderboard. Because the code updates that come out on these machines are major. I mean, they... Yeah, that's like brand new skill shot. Like, for example, um, a good example is uh, the James Bond pinball machines that mm -hmm. come out. Like, you know, when they first released with the code, it was bare bones. Yeah. Like, there was nothing really in them. You can get multiball and, you know, that's about it. But now they've got, like, the, the latest code update that I played had, like, about five different skill shots you could have, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, it's just... And that is a that is a big gameplay change that would affect your ability to play in the leaderboard. So well, and I remember people saying, and I'm you know I don't have much access to physical pinball, um, but I know that Guardian specifically, a lot of people pointed out to was terrible on its first code yeah. releases, and now is a really really good solid game. So yeah. uh, I think, I just don't I don't see it. I don't either, and I, and I think it's just like. There's been enough tables that we've mentioned 
that I mean, even some of these new ones that we went over where we were like, this could be better, this could be better, this could be better, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> change this. Um, it we have to be able to play the thing first to be able to make suggestions. Yeah, we can't we can't tell you what's wrong with it until we actually right. experience the thing in. But so, if you but if you've already put it out there and leaderboards are happening, well, then what? You know, so that's exactly. And and so yeah. I don't know if it was maybe um, that we just weren't clear enough in our question there or whatever, or maybe We're it just clarify. doesn't. Yeah, or maybe it just doesn't fit Zen's uh, design model, which is look. Mm. Once the designer is done with the table, they're moving on to the next table, rather than having them. There's not a maintenance program in place, essentially. Right. Right. And yeah. and I rather than having it be the table is released and that designer sticks with the table for another two months to mm. register all the feedback and then yeah. potentially make further adjustments. Um, because, mm. uh, and I think we're going to hear this answer in a little bit, uh, spoiler alert. Um, yeah. The designers, I think they get a bit of tunnel vision because of so much of what they're looking over and they're not they're, they're... getting the uh, outside input. Yep, that's yeah. right. Uh, anyhow, yeah, let's move let's, on to the uh, next uh, next question. Well, here. like we said, this is a, the segment of the show that we're going to show deep and see if we can, with with the context of our answers, hopefully deep can provide a textual response to that that we can share with you later on. Because I think it's it's a big enough issue that it would be nice to just seek a little bit of extra scope on it. Yeah. Um, so the next one is about rom status so we we posed to deep the question is there a reason rom status isn't carried over game to game for williams belly recreations uh, some zen originals have this like epic quest and most recently brothers in arms uh we also made the comment as well for clarification as system 11 titles come into play this will be more and more critical so what is uh, what did deep have to say about that Uh, yeah, altering original ROMs is extremely difficult. Uh, it was an enormous task to implement uh, these old systems into Pinball FX, making it possible to support the multiplication of the original scores with uh, upgrade powers. Uh, basically, we can easily change only the options that can be found in the ROMs original operator menu. However, this can be uh, altered uh, even during gameplay real time. Um, additionally, uh, where it is a gameplay feature, uh, we save the progress between games and Bolly Williams tables like uh, the position of the power ball and Twilight Zone, for example. So okay. obviously there with, with Twilight Zone, they did carry over that status. But that is not technically a ROM status, it is a physical ball mm -hmm. status. Mm -hmm. So th this is the... I had to listen to this response a couple of times because there are a few things about Deep's response here that that kind of, I think it might have been lost in translation. I agree. When, so this is something we want to clarify with you, Deep, if you're watching this. When we say ROM status, we mean things like vault letters. We mean things like progressive jackpots in games. These things are all stored as part of the ROM. So to refine this question a bit more, we want to check with you why aren't those elements of the ROM status carried over between games? How would you keep that status of the ROM carried over? And is it possible? That's my question to you. Yeah, because we're not asking to alter the ROM. We're asking the ROM to just carry over, say, quarter to quarter. So in Dr. That's Dude, right. uh, the Dude meter doesn't reset every single game. It It's progressive. It's progressive. Yeah. Um, unless you're in... Tournament mode. Yes. Tournament mode then obviously it does, does reset. the resets. Um, yes. But it's those, like you said, vault letters. Um, if they ever do 8-Ball Deluxe, it's the Deluxe letters. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's in Adam's family, having the thing flip, not have to recalibrate every single time you start. It should know game to game that, oh, on this machine, it's got it pretty dialed in. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, it, it's, that's not a play feature to make it learn. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. So that's what we're asking there. So hopefully we, we can get deep to 
provide some extra clarifying yeah. comments about because and, and I think like with Circus Voltaire, they did figure out you know there's a different set of judges every single time you play. Yes, um, there is. Whereas so something's going on there. Yeah, something they're doing it on some and not on others, but there are definite uh, play features that this is part of the table play. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, even my, my the, the other thing that if they can do things like inject, um, you know, sc like scores and like the, the power ups and stuff like that, could they actually flip a bit here and there and actually credit us with four vault letters from the start or set the ROM so that it has a certain buildup of ROM letters randomly? Mm hmm. It's from game to game so that would then like say you got a game started and you could see that there was four vault letters lit then you would change your gameplay strategy to go for vault letters and then you qualify vault multiball and then go and get vault multiball so at least you could experience it you know what i mean yeah. so yeah now the okay. only thing so that's i can think of as a valid reason not to do this is <laughs> again leaderboards because yeah you would if you could stack, say, Dr. Dude to be all the way up until that final super dupe, super dupe, purposely tank your balls, start the next game so that you, bam, are, are starting right off the bat with that, um, you could goose your score to what it needs to be. Or for those things that have progressive jackpots, um, mm. you know, you could, you could game the system to get there. Uh, so I don't necessarily know the answer to that. Um, yeah, that's the other aspect of it too. Like, it seems that leaderboards, while they're great, are actually causing some degree of issue with how the games are presented yeah. to us as players. So, it's I don't know what would I want more? Would I want leaderboards or would I want these gameplay features? Which is going to be an interesting question that I think we can probably answer towards the end of this. I mean, maybe. honestly, if I were to say anything with, with, regards, with regards to leaderboards it's make the leaderboards with uh tournament settings and when i say tournament settings now i'm not talking about slope of table or i'm not talking about pro versus classic here no I'm talking, about... I'm talking about just yes you're starting at a fresh rom state yeah that's the kind of gameplay that would put you on the leaderboard if you want to play it as experience it for your local high score um, yeah. that's stored on your computer, then the ROM carryovers would happen. Honestly, I think that's the, that feels like the most logical compromise here. Mm -hmm. Like have, have it. So there's like literally tournament mode and local leaderboard mode, you know, yeah. and that gives everyone the chance to actually experience these games as they're designed to be experienced. Yeah but also have that ability to be in a tournament setting and have that, that tournament style experience yep. where everything is turned off. No advantage is there, you know, yeah. like a good example of advantage. What I found the other day, this class of 1812. If you're playing a four player game or like more than one player game, there's like a catch up mode on that, <laughs> which will just award you a whole bunch of points. So it brings you up with the other players. Hmm. <laughs> it just gives you it gives you 20 million points or something you know so you catch up the other players so you know those sort of things need to be turned off yeah because there's things that i want to experience on pinball machines without having to grind for 45 minutes to get to that status um mm. as also for, to... for new players too like yeah we're seeing we're seeing some some clearly some new players coming through on discord that are just really frustrated with some of the difficulties like when they're when they're trying to learn a table and kind of perhaps a fresh to pinball for the first time like these tables they're not easy no um and you know i think to some degree it would be really nice for them to have like a big bang experience like this going whoa what is this yeah because that's the sort of things that it gets you back every yeah. time you go i want to experience that again yeah. you know so yeah I, it's a very it's a it's a problem that i think with this information would be interesting to explore solutions for, I think. All right, so our next question is, has working on Williams Recreations changed how you yourself design pinball, uh, and how so? 
Uh, I couldn't say so, at least not in terms of design. Uh, the Williams body tippers are different enough compared to our designs, mostly because of the nature of digital pinball itself. So we need to think differently. We have more creative freedom uh, when we design a table from scratch. Many rules are the same, but a lot are different. Um, I would rather say the real life tables inspired us in many ways, of course, uh, even before we started to work on the recreations. However, uh, we took benefits from the handling of the GI, the, the global lights. Um, we started to use the method for the GI on our tables as well that we developed for the Williams Bolly table recreations. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so they haven't really leaned in on any of the design aspects, but some of the more fundamental parts of of pinball, they've they've sort of borrowed, I guess. I um, think that kind of also answers our question of why certain pinball tropes aren't followed. <laughs> yeah, because they don't. They actually don't. <laughs> they don't follow follow them at all. It's like no, we're doing our own thing here. We're yeah. doing it the Zen way, yeah. I guess. Which I mean, so, I again. Uh, I'm not necessarily angry at them because no. no, we don't want all pinball to feel the same. And Zen tables have their own flair as compared to a Williams table. Um, but when I get frustrated with a Zen table, it's almost always because they're not following what I think classic pinball design follows. Uh, it's more of a, even if you take the, I guess the tropes of, pinball out of it and just focus on how how would a user learn your game mm -hmm. without necessarily having to lean on the instructions that i mean it does circle back to those common pinball tropes but it doesn't necessarily mean that they they don't have to use those exact things to communicate what needs to be done there are ways of actually saying hey if you want a light kickback then you do this in the game, yeah. you know, and it's all about the DMD and it's all about how you present the light show and all that sort of stuff, which deep covers a bit later. Well, I was going to say, it's actually but, the next question. If you want to read it, because I think it goes right into it. It sure does. And the, the question that we asked was a gripe we've had for years and years with Zen originals is how critical DMD info um, which is dot matrix display info often is displayed at the same moment the ball is heading towards the flipper. Is this by choice or is it a scripting issue and or is it something you've just never even noticed? So let's go to the answer. Um, this is something we can't and don't really want to always keep in control. Um, just imagine a table where the ball gets always held in a sinkhole or saucer and waits for the text to display. This would be much more frustrating in my opinion than uh, letting the instructions come and go as they triggered. Uh, I personally used to hold the ball for the most important text, then release it uh, and make these messages skippable, not to bore the more experienced players. Uh, I think this is a good compromise maybe. Totally agree. Make them skippable, but don't launch the ball while we're trying to read them. I think for me, <laughs> it's how about make the first time <laughs> uh, the info is important, you hold it, and thereafter, if you you know relight that same hole or whatever, or do the same thing, it, now you understand what is happening. Um, yeah. So you don't need to display all that information again. My, I just remember when I... <laughs> I'd played Iron Man, and I'd finally gotten to the wizard mode. And I start the wizard mode, and there was a block of text up on the DMD telling me what to do. And at the same time, I'm trying to capture the ball, but it's multi-ball. And by the time... So you can't. I, right. And by the time I had any kind of control, the message was already gone. <laughs> and I had no clue what to do, and then I instantly drained, and... Now I had to restart everything to light wizard mode again. Oh, and that was wow. extraordinarily frustrating because it took yeah, forever that's to get there. Yeah. And it's like, come on. When we're getting into something big like that, that is a that takes a lot of effort to make that achievement happen, let us have that moment to digest what is coming out on the DMD. Or, as me and Jared have kept on saying, how about make better callouts that specifically yes. tell you 
where to go. And you only have to do that call out once the very mm -hmm. first time. Yep, that's right. Or do what, like, again, this is leaning in on pinball tropes that, you know, uh, are there in most wizard modes. Like, think of Circus Voltaire wizard mode. It's broken up into segments, mm -hmm. right? So you've got Spell Circus, like, Destroy the Ringmaster. Um, and I think then there's there's one more thing, which I've forgotten. Um, but it stages out, the point I'm making is it stages out the things you need to do. It doesn't go... Big wall of checks, now do all those things. And then off you go. Because you're going to forget. Like, yeah. You know, your heart's pounding. Your, the adrenaline's rushing because you're actually at the wizard mode. You're not going to remember anything. You need to be reminded. So, yeah. you know. Or I think about something like, uh, whether it be Battle for the Kingdom or, uh, what was it, Attack Mars? Even Royal general, Madness. Royal Madness. Where the light show tells you everything you need to know because that's where Correct. your eye is. It's not up at the D&D. &D. Yes. It's down on the play field. And the light yep. show tells you, hey, why is this light roving from spot to spot? I bet if I hit it and when it's in that spot, something big is going to happen. Sure enough, mm -hmm. that's a jackpot on Attack from Mars. Or yep. in uh, with Royal Madness, it clearly, you know, the ball gets locked and it clearly tells you, you know, uh, 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 Catapult, the game mode. damsel, uh, yep. joust, multiball. And you're like, well, what about troll and dragon multiball? I didn't get those. Interesting. Yeah. But it the call-outs help you understand what it is and why it is that's happening. But you never have to look up the DMD. Everything is no. right there in the light show on the, on the table. Yep. Yes. And th this, this is the point. Like, the light shows are important. Yeah. Which is probably actually the next question. I it think is. Talk, I'll just we, say we that talk about. this gripe isn't specifically to Zen because it's the same gripe I have about Jersey Jack Pinball. There's so much stuff happening on the display that I yeah, feel is, is for the audience heavy. and not for the actual pinball player. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It seems to be like uh, I, I, the the, the uh, it, it's all about enticing people over. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is tricky. And, you know, with Jersey Jack, there's just so much lighting. Uh, everything's lit. Everything's yes, linking. Everything's lit you know, there, and glowing. There's no, there's like, with Jersey Jack, it's not just like shots are lit. There's, there's varying intensities of light, <laughs> which tell you which ones are important. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah, anyway, let's, let's move go on to, the, uh, to this question. So it's uh, talk to us about lighting. On Zen Originals, physical GI lighting seems scarce compared to an actual machine. Uh, does any thought go into how you'd light a purely digital table as if it were a physical machine? Uh, table lighting was always a cruel question at Zen. Many of us wanted the tables to be darker, like real-life tables, while some of us wanted them to be brighter so the ball can be more visible and easier to track. Uh, the latter one, since this is a video game at first, and uh, pinball simulation as a close second, so playability became the first priority. Um, however, uh, we always searched for possibilities how we could implement an option for the players adjusting the light somehow that uh, won't ruin the experience. Um, also, the light show is one of the most important visual feedback for the players uh, on a pinball table. And I think we have quite some evolution to make in this territory. Uh, I have some ideas how could uh, we implement a, a much better show into our tables. Uh, hopefully we can move forward with this very soon. That's encouraging. That sounds promising. It does. Mm. Yeah, um, that really does sound promising. Because clearly they're aware that uh, the light show can be improved. <laughs> um, yeah. I... Uh, Trying to think what, the, what was the first part that uh, that struck out to me. I don't know. What what was your thoughts there, Jared? Maybe it'll come back to me. Um, I think over. Well, I think overall, um, they know it's a problem, which is yeah. great. Like this response is that it's it's a problem. They the the whole thing about the fact that it's a video game versus a a pinball simulation is an interesting. An interesting position to take. I That's think. what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> mm. So, uh, Farsight obviously implemented a light slider. Um, it wasn't the best, but it was something. Uh, yeah. Magic Pixel has uh, not a light slider, but a uh, time of day slider um, to make mm. that effective. 
And here we are, Zen using Unreal, and I think we were fully expecting the ability to fully customize what that look is. Um, mm. And it's instead baked in. Because I know that while we've kind of gotten our way with uh, those of us that like darker tables, with what they've done with the Williams tables, I know there's some people out there that are like, they're too dark! And then the flip side is, we commented about how we wished some of these Zen tables were darker, um, rather than being so cartoony bright, to mm. make the light show stand out a little bit more. Um, so I, I'm I'm curious to why Zen hasn't put that in the user's hands and let us uh, determine that. Yeah, I've been messing around with HDR recently um, and did a stream with it on, which wasn't overly successful because it does weird things when you stream HDR. Mm. Um, but in game, it was looking amazing like the things like the belly williams tables with hdr on and you know you can you can adjust there's two things you can adjust you can adjust the uh i guess the contrast or the nits i guess i don't know what you really call it but there's a setting that makes that allows you to make the the interface really dark or really light light and make it really sort of overexposed or like a little bit darker mm -hmm. and and i've got mine set down to like 500 which is the the value um and it feels like the games are in a darkened room yet the light sources are actually coming out and and being way more prominent in the game so i mean i, I wonder if that work around it. because i don't have hdr screens the only thing that's available to me is gamma and i almost feel like that's the same thing using the gamma slider um mm. which isn't true affecting of lighting uh all you're it's doing not. is like you said you're changing the brightness you're changing the contrast but that's not um real-time actual lighting that's happening uh that's just you messing basically with monitor settings <laughs> i think hdr gets it closer so okay i don't know it'd be interesting to see what the comments in youtube say about hdr yeah like but, i said i just um, i don't understand why we can't just have a slider or a three setting thing where it's here's stadium Lighting. Here's regular room lighting. Here's and he is dark lights room off mode lighting. Yeah, yeah. Having three presets would make it a lot easier to to experience. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's definitely something that would be helpful. I think for just easy configuration for users. You know, because yeah. I'll even say in on a real table, I don't like pin stadium lighting, uh, in, unless no. I'm playing in a tournament where yeah, I want to see everything. Um, that to me is not pinball. Pinball is the mood of a table. Um, so I'd definitely say that I've I've played recently uh, in a room that has not as much lighting in it, yeah. and it actually was a little bit difficult to track the ball on sure. some of the older games. You know, sure. so having just a little bit of light, like almost like if you think about like a central channel of lights running between the machines, like where you would walk. Yeah. But nothing else. That's yeah. that's enough light. That's yeah. just enough light to see what's going on. But it'll be interesting to see if the lighting that he's talking about, um, if it is more uh, to do with them working on their GI lights. Because uh, I, I truly think that's the thing that's lacking in Zen tables. Yep. They so much depend on uh, just the brightness of whatever cartoony thing they've got on you know their, their artwork to be bright and stand out rather than actual table lighting shining on or glowing through things and making it stand out in that manner. Yeah, that's right. A little bit like um, what you see on things like The Getaway, where the GI lighting has a huge impact mm -hmm. on what the game looks like. Yeah. Or even on Space Station, where the lights change from one color to green. Mm -hmm. You know, like that, that sort of stuff is surely something that could be incorporated into designs yeah um but there's another question we have about uh lighting and i think we may as well yep seems like a good idea to launch into that now so the next question we asked was uh the light show on modern pinball machines has ramped up since jc jack stepped onto the scene with wizard of oz a lot goes into it for making the liking lighting informational to help tell a story of what's going on with the mode some machines, as we know now, actually have over 300 RGB lights on them. So can we expect Zen to try and follow suit in this regard? Uh, 
Uh, it's funny you ask this because uh, I just started a thread in-house about uh, our light shows since uh, I think they need some evolution. So I hope the quality could uh, improve very soon. Uh, regarding the quantity of the lights, it's a bit complicated. Uh, I'm afraid we can't place too many more lights into a table because of technical limitations. So we need to evolve mostly in design. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah. there is a cap. There is. All right. There's a cap on light. So they need to be quite careful how they use them at the moment. I wonder if uh, it is just, it sounds like the way they've got their engine set up in Unreal, they've got like a uh, a path cap on how many individual points of light they can put into a game. Um, probably down to also the way that they interact with the ball and stuff like that, mm. perhaps. So perhaps that's the reason why they've got a limit there. Um, maybe it's only a limit at the moment too because they're still trying to improve performance. So perhaps when we, after um, the Switch release happens and all that sort of stuff, they might look again at just adding a few extra points of light in and see what happens with that, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I mean, obviously, eventually, mathematics and how many uh, polygons you have on a table <laughs> to affect gameplay. Oh. Yeah, you've got to balance what mm -hmm. you see in the game versus performance, don't you? So I'd imagine totally it's to do with that. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's if, if that's the hard limit, then that's the hard limit. There's nothing you can do about that, um, really. Um, but at least at least Deep is the, like bro broaching the subject to the team. Yeah. Again, and... he said that he feels that they need an evolution in their lighting. So. So if if you're saying that there's an evolution required, that means that it's it's not technically impossible. Mm -hmm. It's just that it needs some very it needs several iterations, I would think, to get it to the point where it's not going to affect performance. Yeah, and it's totally fine. That means that you know we may see it. It'll be incremental. Yeah, which leads us into our next question, which is uh, uh, maybe part of the reason for this. Um, so we learned mm. from the last pinball show that the lead designer shepherds every aspect of the table. Uh, we know the layout is what designers are most known for, but are they also responsible for scripting callouts, creating game rules, talking with licensors, sound design, etc.? Mm. Here at Zen, the designers are doing basically everything uh, except creating graphics and sounds. So layout, game rules, scripting, uh, all the texts, voiceovers, uh, music and sound and display designs, answering licensors' feedback. These are all designers' territory. So yeah, they are pretty busy. Yeah, that's <laughs> ridiculous. That's a lot. That's wow. a lot on the plate. <laughs> that's a lot so you can that actually if you think about the whole rules piece and stuff like that if they're if they've done a game and then they probably i mean if they've done a game they've got another one probably heating up as far as you know needing to get it released as well because they, they'd be doing it in, in blocks right yeah they'd be down the gantt chat like that so they'd be probably running a couple of different tables at the same time so keep on top of that Jeez. It well, must I just be think hard. that, and this is again, if you are so intimately involved with every single aspect of your table, you're going to start being blind to certain flaws because mm. you just automatically know how to get past it. You know? Yeah, that's right. So uh, that's where it comes back again to the rules of a table. And to somebody fresh to the table, they're not going to know the new rules. They're not going to know how to get there. It's really complicated. But if you've been living with this table <laughs> for and like months iterating on, on end, it for months, trying to get you, the rules right, like yeah. you, you're like the deep dive expert into these rules. So yeah. nothing's going to surprise you. And the you. same thing, if you're the one that's, by that very nature, you're also writing all the callouts. Well, why do I need this detailed callout? It's in the rules. I already know the rules. What, so, you know, it's it's this yeah. circle that never branches out to the new. Um, yeah. To, the, to that It's almost like they need, they, they need that sort of halfway point interaction with, like, impartial people who've never yeah. seen the game. Yeah. And before the point at which the rules are really dialed in, that's when... Because, you know... Bell, uh, Belly, Williams, and Stern, they do location tests, right? Mm -hmm. They used to. 
So they put a game out in a pub um, in Detroit and they collect feedback on it from people. And then they would go back and fix a whole bunch of stuff in the tables based on that feedback before the game was actually finalized and released. They Zen don't do that. So they're missing out on that feedback loop from players. It's, it's kind um, of like they need a Whitewood stage. They need a Whitewood. Yeah, that's yeah. totally what Zen needs here. They need a Whitewood. Well... They, they need a not that Stern standard. does Whitewoods anymore, but they just do put oh, they, it out like you said, put it out in the wild, get some feedback, and then throw out a code change. That's right. They, they basically we are their beta testers. Yeah, now. but you know, and it's funny because if you think about it, they like Stern don't reset their leaderboards, their global leaderboards. Mm-hmm. Like they remain the same regardless of when the ROMs are released and when they're not. So, as far as I'm aware, so if anyone knows it to the contrary. Um, that Zen do leaderboard resets, global ones, then let me know. Yeah. But, um, all right. Any, I think we might as well go on to yeah, the next question. The next. Eh? Okay. So, um, what Zen creation from the past do you think is great as is? And what design would you love to have a second go at, whether it be color palette, rules, music, or layout? And we also further clarified here this is across the entire Zen catalog, not just your designs. Uh, I would love to give another go for our oldest tables uh, like Speed Machine, Agents or Extreme and completely revamp them for today's standards. That would be cool. Uh, Perfect pinball doesn't exist. Uh, I would work uh, on a table for years if I could. (laughs) But um, uh, for example, I think Sorcerer's Lair uh, is pretty close to perfect. I would only change minor things on that table like score balance, shot timers, uh, raising number of necessary shots over time. Maybe update to the new display, things like that. Well, if that doesn't sound mm. like code update, I don't know what does. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that's that what we're asking update. for. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we're asking for too. Go, go do that, except across everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, okay, sounds okay. good to me. <laughs> you know, um, I do like though the that idea of going back to your older tables and all the things that you've learned reapplying them to that and making it better yeah and and absolutely you know my favorite table to uh to complain about v12 it's not that it's a bad layout it's that it's a bad code and it's just yeah. doesn't it's not intuitive the lighting is is not good you know the light show where to go so yeah go revamp the crap out of it um make it more fun to play Heck it's yeah. not that the layout's the issue it's not that the toys are the issue it's plenty of other things that are the issue <laughs> that's right it's just it's just old compared to the other games yeah. and you know if you you could say well isn't you know things like um taxi compared to medieval madness old in comparison but i think the difference there is that there's a, a certain level of gameplay refinement mm-hmm. across in taxi that's already there that isn't really in those early zen tables and that's the difference like yes. there's a you can see that, like the, the rules just aren't quite there, and you know well, that sort I mean, of stuff. What I would say with Taxi is, you know, that was released in the mid '80s. Um, mm. Williams had already had twenty-five years plus of pinball experience to that point, mm-hmm. so yeah. that's what's feeding into that. Now, if you want to go way back into those, you know, EM <laughs> era machines and tweak some things. I mean, unfortunately, that's kind of the character of an EM. That's what makes an EM yeah. an EM. Um, yeah, they, they, they were crazy, like mad professor stuff in EMs. Right, right. Yeah. Um, but a good example of that is when Zen did, or not Zen, um, Stern did Wonelli. And it was like, hey, yeah. here's our take on what a modern EM would be. Mm-hmm. It didn't rewrite all the Absolutely. rules, but it corrected some of the things that... I mean, it still feels like an EM, but it feels like a modern EM. And yeah. I think that's what we're asking for, is, is, and that would be a good idea for Zen to go back to those early, early tables, is, look, you've got a Zen style now. Just Apply reapply it. it. You know what works on a screen with your color palette, and for God's sakes, change some of that music. <laughs> Oh yeah, geez. It's the the music I think is one of the 
biggest thing that dates these tables. Oh. Like it's that, it's that generic electronica. And it just, just drives ruins. and drives and drives and has nothing to do with what mode you're in. Yep. It, just... Honestly, the, the, there's some Marvel tables that really suffer from that generic electronica. Oh, there's some that well. I just plain turn off the music. Yeah. The, I mean, the, 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 the table's intolerable. better without the music. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of like, uh, not noir. Uh, what was the one that we just recently played that we were like, oh, um, uh, Elder Gods. Elder Gods. Yeah, just turn off the music. Yeah. Turn off the music. It's it's just definitely better. Oops, wrong button. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go into the next question, which is uh, switching to Unreal Engine. What opportunities have opened up, both for existing tables and new ones yet to be released? Will switching to Unreal Five be on the horizon? And if so, what challenges or advantages do you anticipate? Unreal Engine has much more possibilities than the old one. Uh, the new display that replaced the old dot matrix has definitely become possible with Unreal Engine. Uh, the material, particle and lighting system is also new, so better effects are possible now. Short and sweet. Short and sweet, no confirmation about Unreal 5. No. Um, which, you know, Doesn't would be a big me. deal. And honestly, they're only really just into development of Unreal 4 trying to understand that engine. So yeah. that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. So oh, and yeah. sweet. I agree. Yeah. All right. Next question, Jared. Next question. All right. Different eras of machines have different mechanics. Flippers from an early 80s belly are nothing like a modern stern. Depending on the machine, springs or plungers have different tensile strengths, such as Twilight Zone's loose spring. Do you lose? Do you use different physics on table parts to accurately simulate how a machine actually plays, or do you have a one-size-fits-all table parts for the ones that you've modelled? When we recreate a real-life table, we always start with some playtests so we can see how the ball moves around on the specific table. Uh, we record the gameplay and uh, also check other videos can be found on the internet since there are no two identical machines. Um, then we disassemble the machine, digitize all the parts one by one. Uh, after this, when all comes together in the game, we hook up the ROM and the mechanics slides. Then start to fine tune the collisions, which rubber uh, should bounce the ball how much, um, which hole or up kicker should launch the ball how strong, stuff like that. Um, this could, however, be very different between machines uh, of the same title, depending the age of the rubbers, uh, how dirty the machine is, how much used the mechanics are. So this is not as straightforward as you would think. Uh, we always try to simulate a brand new out-of-box pinball experience with our older real-life pinball recreations as well as our original creations. Hmm. I mean, I Definitely. guess it, 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 it makes a lot of sense because I don't think that Zen is digitally recreating all the flipper mechanics of how a flipper actually works. <laughs> um, no, they they don't have the same mission as Farsight has to like preserve digital pinball, which is what they're on about. Well, um, but I mean, I don't not that Farsight really captured that no, um, in the yeah, end. Well, but you know what I end, mean. No. Well, there, if you look at an early '80s Bally flipper compared to a mid 90s williams flipper the mechanics how it's actually built and and functions mechanically is they're different yeah. um but i guess it's not entirely necessary if cuz digitally you can just dial it and like he's saying you can you know determine what the rubber is you can determine what the strength of the flipper is um so i guess it doesn't need to be modeled specifically uh, after each thing and you know, there's the the other point to this as well is that you know there's plenty of people out there to put things like Titan bands on their pinball right. machine, which are co like a completely different gameplay experience to what the designer intended yeah. when they created the, the 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 game. So, you know, I was playing a, a game on site the other day where I attempted like a dead bounce, which should have happened off the flipper, and it just lost all momentum and just rolled straight down the flipper. <laughs> you know, so there was no there was no dead bounceable stuff and something. So you know. That's a factor as well. There's going to be, you know, more modern things out there for pinball that do actually change the way people would have played these older tiles anyhow. So I don't know. Is it really that important? If, if they're aiming for new and box yeah. um, as the experience, which is obviously, you know, what you want, 
when you're actually playing something brand new. Um, I mean, that's probably a good baseline, really, isn't it? It is, and it's obviously very difficult um, because nobody today is getting to experience what a new inbox Williams machine <laughs> is. You know what I mean? Nobody has no. a fun house lying around that's new in box and then being able to crack that open and go, oh, here's how it should actually play. Um, the only way you can do it, the only way would be to completely rebuild every mechanism in the game. Yeah, right. Like, like you know, scrounge new old, old stock parts and just replace every single mechanism in the game. Yeah. You know, and some people have done that with some of these tables. Mm. Like, I've seen it done. And it's it is interesting, but honestly, even if you're just like replacing the fundamental parts of a machine, like you know, or just rebuild the flippers, that'll get you eighty percent of the way there. Yeah, all the other mechanisms and stuff like that, you can, you know, like the, the scoops and stuff are the thing that really affect gameplay as well and consistency in those. So you know, scoops and kickouts, if you can get those rebuilt to a point that's all new parts or mostly new parts, then you you're pretty much getting a new inbox experience there anyhow really yeah uh, makes a huge difference to gameplay a shop one versus a non-shop one like it's night and day so in a, in a lot of ways it reminds me of uh people that do car restorations and mm. are bringing the car back to they're not modifying the car they're bringing it back to um all original mm. doing that kind of restoration but the thing that they can't help themselves on <laughs> is lining up the gaps between the panels because oh, right. back yeah. in the day no car manufacturer cared about it the, the, the gaps yeah. varied all over the place but any of these rest restoration people they make it so the gaps are perfect like they are on today's car so even that kind of detail is different than if you had a bought it right off the lot back in you know the mid 60s for a muscle car so yeah um i i guess in a lot of respects that's what zen is doing with these tables they're um recreating them to the best but they're also throwing in a little bit of the uh, the modern bling <laughs> yeah and making them yeah just a little bit more reflective of what you might see in an arcade now with stern yeah um Man, it's interesting, isn't it? It is. But that was a good response. I found that yeah. quite informative. I did too. I did too. It kind of changes my uh, my view of uh, how they assemble these things. So, yeah. Um, next question. Now that cabinet right. mode is a must, and that Zen even had the cabs put out by Arcade One Up, do you think about in your designs things like rumble motors, solenoids, backlash interactions, etc.? Uh, basically, I'm just asking: Are you in? future proofing your tables to make it so that these things automatically uh happen for a cab stuff mm. we have a long list of cabinet features we would like to implement and uh, plan to support the mode as much as we can going forward uh we'll have more info on this as we go forward i can't speak of these specifics yet boo mm. <laughs> boo no specific but like it sounds like yeah if you got a cabinet Strap on, strap on, <laughs> strap in, and strap on because yeah. it's going to be interesting. I was like, clearly, next. clearly, designs are, uh, are are or plans are in the works, um, and the fact that he can't talk about them tells Means me that they're that juicy. It's, well, juicy, but they're also contract related. Um, Man, it could actually be if he can't really divulge them. Yeah, so that's interesting as well. It is very interesting. Oh, this is uh, oh, this next question is going to be interesting. All right, <laughs> let, let's let's dive straight into it. So, uh, we asked uh, Deep Zen has avoided the dual flipper buttons, yet certain titles like the Shadow or Black Knight demand it. Has this been a discussion point? Control input is a crucial subject for us designers. Uh, we always struggle when we plan a bit more complicated mini game, and we can use only the two flipper buttons and the launch button for it. Sadly, this is a limitation we can't ignore, because all and every button is used in a normal controller, so we just can't use more. The difference between the analog triggers and the digital shoulder buttons uh, prevents us from forcing either for the players. So if we bring, for example, the shadow into Pinball FX, uh, we could uh, only use the launch button for the RAM diverters. 
And you can see his disappointment in his face when he tells us this. Like, <laughs> you can just I see he's like... I don't get it. <sighs> Farsight can do it. I don't get it either. Farsight did it. Yeah, Farsight know, did it. And, yeah. and I think Magic Pixel maybe has done it. I'm not quite sure if Magic Pixel has. Um, but Farsight definitely did it. I don't... Yeah. And, and, and not only did they do it, they let you pick whether you were going to be using the triggers... Or the shoulder buttons. You can just swap them. But the whatever you put for your main flippers, then the other uh, buttons would be for your secondary flippers. Yeah, and that's um, exactly right. But, you know, when we played Black Knight, I say it's critical for that because it's where do you light the magnet save? Are you lighting on the right or are you writing it on the left? Because you have the choice of magnets there. Um, yeah. You know, when we played uh, Starship Troopers, now, granted, that's a Data East machine or Star yeah, Sega. I don't know which. Anyway, it's, Sega. it's Stern, so it's not coming to us anyway. Um, but it literally had the secondary mid flipper. Yeah, it was a separate a, flipper, and it was an actual gameplay feature that yeah. if you use that flipper independently, you got more points by flipping it. So just having it on all the time, you know, is is not what you want at all. So I don't buy that. I don't uh, either. And and the other thing that an bugs answer. me is. Okay, if I'm playing with a controller and hitting the, the launch button to do one of these things, it's not really a big deal, right? No. If I'm playing on a cab, if I have to reach all the way down and slap the front launch button, that's a that big deal. That is a big deal. Because it's not that's just a actually, finger twitch. Yeah, that's absolutely going to affect the... It's going to give an advantage to controller players yep. over cabinet players for sure. With yep. that, so I, I think that's they really need to rethink how they do dual flipper buttons. There, it's not, it's not impossible. It, it, that's the that's the point. It's not. Well, impossible. there's prior art. There's absolutely prior art with Farsight. They did it, and no one complained. No. There was no accessibility issues with it. No, like you basically set your primary flipper buttons, and the the other shoulder buttons are something else. And if you want to re, it like maybe his point is if you want to remap all the buttons. Well, if you remap all the buttons, then just move those functions to another button of the player's choice. Yeah. And uh, and here is the ne- here is the next question, actually, Chris, which goes quite nicely into what we've just yes. been talking about. So how about we dive into oh, it? I do it. Um, so uh, I, th- I think it might be yours, but I can read it if you like. Yeah, go ahead and read um, it. So why can we not key map buttons to controllers in any way we want, as opposed to the set controller options currently offered? Uh, actually, we are working on this, so you'll find the option in an upcoming update. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, I, so you're saying that you can't remap buttons, but you you, you can't. Well, no, we'll he's saying that we, the they're going to remap buttons, but they can't assign Duplicate new buttons. Functions. Like they can't create one more button, and that's what I don't it's get because when I'm playing currently, I'm either only using the shoulder buttons or only using the trigger buttons. There's nothing at all in pinball effects that requires me to use both. No, there's not. So why can't we make one of these do the secondary yeah. function? Magnus save. I don't buy it. I don't I buy don't it. I don't buy it as a, as a reason at all. I think that needs to be absolutely revisited and make it so these extra functions can be put onto the, the flippers because cabinet customers will not stand for it. Yeah, well, I can tell you that now. There's your market resource search right there. They won't want it. Um, so I, I, the other thing would be to maybe do what Stern has been doing for years. And I correct me if I'm wrong. Is Jersey Jack started doing it? The center button on top of the lock bar. Yep. This well, yes. The, and this is valid. The center, the center button on the lock bar. That is definitely used on things like Black Knight for the Magnus save, like Black okay. Knight Swords of Rage. Um, and all Stern games pretty much have that center launch. So that's your launch button on the top as well. Okay. Um, as your um, plunger. I, I, I so. guess I wouldn't... Look, the number of tables that actually require a second flipper button are few and far between. There are very few that, that need it. You, that's right. And they're mostly early sold states. Yes. So if you were, as an alternative, to make that center button a function on top of a lock bar so that whatever yeah. uh, 
uh, cabs you eventually produce have that built in. I would accept that. Um, mm. Here's my other thing, and I programmed this in, on, or not programmed it, I built it into my pin sim. I built a third button. And so I had my, my two flipper buttons, and then below that I had a third button, and that third button right. was for activating power. Um, right. For the Zen so machines. you could easily, if you were making your own cabinet, you could just go, well, if Zen aren't going to enable the the second tier buttons for functions, I'll put those on my cabinet and I'll just assign them to a different button. Yeah. I'll, like I'll I'll make it so both of those things are actually wired in for the launch or the A button or whatever it is on your controller that you're using. And that solves that problem, I guess. But, you know, I think if, like, if, the, if we're going to see these commercial cabs coming out, if that's going to actually come to pass, then again, look at the design tropes that are on modern cabinets of today. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be center lockdown buttons for sure. Yeah. Uh, lockdown bar buttons for sure. That's, that is the, the standard set very consistently in place yeah. um, at the moment. So do that. Yeah. Um, so that was all the, uh, that was all the questions that we had for deep. That is it. That was mm. it. Um, we really appreciate deep that uh, you took the time to to answer those to the best of your ability uh, for the information that you were actually able to. <laughs> we understand yeah. that there's stuff that you couldn't divulge, um, plans that are in the works that you can't divulge. Um, but absolutely, if uh, uh, if there's anything you would like to follow up on, um, if there was anything that was lost in translation and uh, you'd like to follow up on, um, you know, either send more video or uh, send us uh, an email and we'll read the responses here uh, as to, to what that's addressed. Yep, absolutely. Um, we'd, we'd love to um, address any follow-ups you've got uh, to our takes on your answers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, absolutely stoked that you were able to do it. Uh, and thanks to Akosh for organizing the, the connection for us as well. Yeah. Uh, um, to with, our with audience, the... you heard deep. Is there a table that you have a different set of rules that you would want applied to for the Zen Originals? Um, if you do, uh, please go ahead, forward them to us. Uh, you could uh, contact us via Twitter uh, with a direct message, or you can send it to our email, blah, blah, blockade at gmail.com, and we will forward it directly to Deep. Um, we have that address. <laughs> um, mm, uh, so, right. yeah, if you guys have uh, any ideas for how to improve some of these tables where it would be literally like doing a code update, um, send them along. We'll, we'll pass them forward. If, if Deep is open to receiving those, then we're happy to uh, send them forward and see what, uh, what comes of it. Yeah, for sure. Yep. The invitation's been put out. Okay. Okay, so we'll take advantage of it. <laughs> all right. So we hope all of you uh, enjoyed that uh, little deep dive into Deep's mind. Um, mm. We'll see what uh, transpires next. Obviously, we have not heard uh, anything about when next release is because uh, we're obviously not getting monthly releases anymore. Um, no. No. So we're not sure what uh, what's coming down the pipe when the next pinball show is or any of that uh, business. So odds are next time, if uh, nothing new has come, we'll probably do another gameplay sort type of video. So if there's any particular table you want us to check out, I know we promised uh, we'd maybe get to South Park. Um, but if there's anything else you want us to uh, check out, there's quite a bit for us now <laughs> to take a look at. Yeah. So, so yeah, let us know. Uh, and same goes for me as well. If you want me to do any particular game during the stream, you can you can tell me what I should play. I'm always looking for suggestions. Yep. So uh, yeah, to, to get on to uh, Twitch and and tell me what I should do. All right. <laughs> Until next time, though. Well, there's always everything that Jared likes to talk about, which is of course the stuff and things. So until then, folks. Bye bye. See ya.